Good morning, everybody. First off, can uh, can you hear me okay? Um, great. Uh, so let's begin. It's a pleasure, uh, and it's always a pleasure to uh, to follow my dear friend uh, Ramez Nam. Uh, he is a phenomenal speaker, and uh, you'll hear some of these concepts over and over again. So let me continue. I'm broadcasting to you from uh, from Los Angeles, and I can only tell you I truly wish I was there with you. Um, here is the challenge uh, that all of us here are working and thinking and seeing the world with a brain that evolved hundreds of thousands and millions of years ago. Our brain has a hundred uh, billion neurons, a hundred trillion synaptic connections. And the way that we think is best described as local and linear. And the world back when our brain was evolving as, you know, cavemen 200,000 years ago and our prefrontal cortex 2 million years ago, the world back then was very constant. Nothing changed generation to generation, nothing changed millennium to millennium, and whatever affected you was within a day's walk. Today, the world is very different. Today, the world is global and exponential. Things are not changing every century or every decade. It's not even changing every year. A lot of times, the world is changing every month, and things that affect you are not you know, in the country next door. They're on the other side of the planet. And so, if you think about that, our brains are not wired to really anticipate the rate of change. And it's for this reason that we have these cognitive you know, conflicts and these, these, uh, these misinterpretations of how fast the world is changing. So you're going to hear these elements uh, again and again, but uh, we are looking at the world as humans in a very linear mindset while at the same time, the world is growing exponentially, right? We uh, understand these concepts. You're going to be hearing about them over and over again. Computation, sensors, networks, AI, robotics, 3D printing, synthetic biology, augmented virtual reality, blockchain are doubling in power year on year. And the difference between this red line, us linear humans, and this yellow line uh, these exponential technologies is either stressful or it's an amazing opportunity, depending on your point of view. And so Ramez mentioned this, and I'm going to hit on a few of the thoughts that he hid, but let me give you a little more details. In 1996, Kodak is at the top of its game. It had a brand like you could not purchase. Uh, and as he said, Stephen Sasson, 20 years earlier, had invented the digital camera in the lab. It literally uh, took, uh, you know, photographs on in black and white on a tape drive, uh, you know, on the order of, uh, you know, a few megapixel, uh, you know, a fraction of a megapixel, 0 0.01 megapixel. And back then, they were valued as a company that was in the paper and chemicals business. And when they refused to actually commercialize a digital camera, a few years or a few decades later, Kodak goes bankrupt, put out a very a business by the very technology that they had invented. In the same year that Kodak files for bankruptcy, another company called Instagram gets acquired by Facebook for a billion dollars. The difference was that Instagram had 13 employees. And this moment in time where a linear thinking company like Kodak is being disrupted by exponential technologies is going to be happening over and over again. Let me give you another example here. Um, this, by the way, is what it looks like. You can see that yellow line is film photography, which literally falls off a cliff while digital photography is taking off. And last year was 1.6 trillion digital photographs. Here's another company. Uh, you guys may remember a company called Blockbuster, at least it was prevalent here in the United States. It would rent you those video cassette um, video cassettes for watching movies. And you can see that red line, Blockbuster is a linear company is falling off a cliff. And here's this small company called Netflix coming along. Now, in 2010, when, when Blockbuster goes bankrupt, Netflix is worth $2.2 billion. 
But when you're riding on top of an exponential technology, this is what happens. Eight years later, it jumps from $2 billion to $150 billion. There's no way in the world that a linear company like Blockbuster could have opened anywhere near enough stores to have created that kind of value. But that's only half the story. Here's the other half of the story. Look at this green line here. The year, it's late 2008. This is during a Blockbuster investor call in which uh, the CEO of Blockbuster, who has twice had the option to buy Netflix, basically says neither Redbox nor Netflix are even on the radar screen in terms of competition. And so the question is, how much more wrong could you be? And the challenge is that as CEOs of companies, and I've had the pleasure to start you know, 21 different companies at this point, we become enamored with our company, with the way we do business. We become defensive if anybody comes out and says, hey, have you considered this? And it's critically important that we question and we don't defend what kind of technology we use, our business models, and so forth. Let me show you another example. This is data from within the United States. And the question is, how fast could things change? So here are retail stores in the United States in the year 2006. You've heard of many of these, Sears, JCPenney, Best Buy, Macy's, Target. And down there at the bottom is little Amazon at $17.5 billion. And if you were to go to any of these CEOs of these large retail chains and said, listen, this little company, Amazon, is going to eat your lunch. The question is, how would you have reacted if you were the CEO of Sears or Macy's or JCPenney? I think you'd probably say, what are you, kidding me? You know, Amazon, it's a bookseller, for God's sakes, and it has no stores. But 10 years later, this is what happens, right? Minus 94%, minus 90%, minus 71%. And down there is Amazon back in 2016 at nearly minus 3,000%. And today, of course, it's over $820 billion. And what we're seeing is Amazon as a nimble, agile company doing something the other companies didn't dare do. They're disrupting up and down the food chain. So Amazon begins by selling books and it says, hey, you know what? We're going to start to uh, cannibalize our suppliers and we're going to publish books. And we're going to also buy our own fleets of airplanes and deliver them. And we're going to start going into adjacencies like movies and you know, who, food, healthcare, insane. So – we're going from a, an era of I've got an idea to I run a billion dollar company faster than any time ever in human history, right? So uh, YouTube was started by a friend, Chad Hurley, on his credit cards for $1.6 billion. I mean, sorry, he started on his credit cards and sells it to Google for $1.6 billion 18 months later. Instagram, which was purchased for a billion dollars by Facebook, and people laughed at that valuation. And, you know, today it's a $30 billion asset. There's no way to explain Uber and Lyft to the CEOs of taxi car companies. Uh, this is an eye chart, and I don't want you to read this. I want you to simply see this is the rate at which we are creating these unicorns, these billion dollar companies. On the far left, 2011, they're happening, you know, three, four times a year. And then as we head into 2015, 16, 17, we're getting literally dozens and dozens per year. So you're going to hear this over and over again. I think it's important. Uh, I attend the Singular University executive programs every month, and I always love hearing the faculty that you're going to hear about in these couple of days. And so uh, you know, repetition makes for – really penetration into our 100 trillion synaptic connections. This is Gordon Moore, one of the founders of Intel, who started the company in 1958. And in 1965, he publishes a very famous paper. And he says, you know, we've noticed something at Intel. 
that over the last seven years, the number of transistors on a piece of silicon has roughly doubled every 12 to 18 months. And then he said in this famous paper, it's likely to continue at that rate. And that became norm, known as Moore's Law. And Moore's Law has continued for 50 years. But let me give you a visual representation of what that looks like. So in 1958, this is the first integrated circuit. It's two transistors, about two centimeters at a size. And fast forward to Intel's first commercial product, the year is fourth. Uh, the year is 1971. Intel 4004. It's 2,300 transistors, about a dollar each. Now, this is still incredible. When I see 1971, that we had these. But let's fast forward to today. This is the Intel Core i9, and we've got over seven billion transistors, less than a millionth of a penny each. And what we're seeing here over the course of 47 years is a 27 billion fold price performance increase. So, I mean, this is incredible power that is transforming our world and we think nothing of it. I'm sitting here at my desk and I'm, I'm, I look at my desk drawer and I've got all of these phones just sitting here that I've thrown in my desk drawer over the years. And these are all massive supercomputers that I toss in the drawer and think nothing of them. But, you know, literally, they have more computational power than the defense departments of nations had 20 years ago. Let's look at another example of exponential growth in our world today. In 1956, this was a five megabyte hard drive. And it cost $120,000. And if you happen to have your cargo airplane, you could move it from location to location. Now, we noticed when this happened, when, you know, a few decades later, it's now 25 times more memory, 128 megabytes, a thousand times cheaper. But did we notice when this happened, when nine years later, right on schedule, it's now a thousand times more memory for the same price? Moore's Law beautifully demonstrated. And, you know, literally, it doesn't slow down, right? Now it's a terabyte on a little disk, a little, you know, thumb uh, uh, sand disk card that you could lose in your pocket. And the numbers are incredible. It's a 10 trillion fold price performance volume improvement in memory density. And it's not slowing down, right? I'm an investor, as is Ray Kurzweil, in a company that's focused on nanotechnology you know, and the notion is we can put all of Google's data centers on a sugar cube in the future. So this is a curve, again, you'll see a dozen times, a hundred times over these next couple of days. This is the computational power growth between 1900 and 2010. It's a relatively smooth curve. That red segment at the end is what's called Moore's Law. But as Ray Kurzweil describes it, this is the law of accelerating returns. It's not just computational growth from integrated circuits. It's electromechanical computers and relays and vacuum tubes, transistors. We're building faster computers to build the next generation of faster computers and the next generation, and it doesn't slow down. And so literally seven year, five years from now in 2023, $1,000 now buys you the computational power of the human brain, 10 to the 16 cycles per second. And then 25 years later, now a thousand U.S. dollars buys you the computational power of the entire human race. So, what's going on here? What's going on is that faster, cheaper computers. Uh, we just saw in the United States the announcement of the Summit computer, uh, you know, 200,000 petaflops of computational power. Uh, beating the previous champion out of China. We've got this race for more and more computational power. This year, we're going to see quantum supremacy coming online. The first time that a quantum computer can be shown to do something that a classical computer cannot do. But computational power is becoming faster, cheaper, always on, available everywhere. You can think of it as almost infinite computing power. And that computing power is driving everything else 
again, sensors, networks, AI, robotics, synthetic biology, all of these technologies. And you're going to hear from experts on all of these. But here's what makes it special for me. I'm not thinking about any one of these. It's the combination. It's the convergence of two, three, or four, the new business models, the new ecosystems that are coming up with these disruptive changes that are really hard to predict. So let me talk about some of these disruptive changes. Let me, let's talk about um, what's changing in the world as a result of these exponential technologies. All right, the first concept is that we're taking anything that used to be scarce and making it abundant. So one of my favorite examples of this is a friend of mine's company in the Bay Area, not far from Singular University, is called the Diamond Foundry. And what would we think of as more scarce than a perfect diamond, right? But this company, the Diamond Foundry, has built these machines. Uh, they built about 10 of them, and they're manufacturing as fast as they can. In one end comes methane, electricity, and water. Out the other end comes manufactured uh, what they call California cultured diamonds or above ground diamonds. And they're real diamonds, four carats, six carats, eight carats, 10 carats. How big would you like them? And so when we think about this, again, something that used to be scarce becoming abundant. So what else do you think of as scarce? Uh, honestly, I truly believe there is very little that is really scarce. You're going to hear from Ramez about energy right? We used to go out to hunt whales on the open ocean to get whale oil to light our night skies. Then we ravaged mountainsides for coal. Then we drilled, you know, kilometers under the ocean floor for oil. And now we know that our planet is bathed in 8,000 times more energy from the sun than we consume as a species in a year. And if you have abundant energy, you've got abundant water. Uh, healthcare and learning, the best healthcare on the planet, the best learning on the planet will effectively eventually all be free, right? These devices are going to provide us all of the healthcare, all the learning that we need. Um, time, I'll be talking to you about extending the human lifespan. There's more capital flowing into the marketplace out of the sovereign wealth funds, out of initial coin offerings, these cryptocurrency token generation events. We're seeing these multi-hundred billion dollar, literally trillion dollar funds coming in to invest in AI and robotics from Masasan out of Japan, out of SoftBank. More access to expertise, more access to resources. Honestly, there is nothing that is truly scarce. So let's continue. Here's a great example. Um, I, I love this. This was a recent find. Uh, you know, people say, or oh, we've got a scarcity of resources on this planet. Well, off the coast of Japan, just recently, within this past year, uh, a group of scientists found in the silt, in the ocean floor, 16 million tons of rare earth oxides, enough to give us all of the battery technology, phones, electric cars we need for something like four hundred years just off the coast of Japan. Again, every time technology allows us to look further and farther, we go from a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset. All right, let's talk about connecting the world. This is a massive implication of exponential technologies. What we're going to see next year and in the, in the few years that follow is the deployment of the 5G network, right? Your phones on 4G are generating you know, 100 megabit connection speeds. But imagine when these phones are connecting at 5G at 10 to 100 gigabits, where you can download a movie in a fraction of a second, and where this is covering the entire planet. But of course, it's not just 5G. It's also Facebook with drones and satellites, Google with balloons and satellites, Paul Jacobs, Richard Branson, Greg Weiler, with 900 satellites funded by SoftBank. And then on top of that, you've got SpaceX with their Starlink launching over 4,000 satellites starting next year 
And then they've said, if that's not enough, we're going to add another layer of 7,000 satellites. What this means is we're about to cover the entire planet in gigabit connection speeds, right? So here are the numbers. In 2010, eight years ago, we had about a quarter of the planet connected, 1.8 billion people. Last year, it was half the planet at 3.8 billion. In the next five to seven years, we're about to connect the entire planet. Literally, another 4.2 billion people who've never been connected at all are about to get connected to the global ecosystem, to our economic systems, to our cognitive systems, to our belief systems, everybody. So what are these 4 billion people going to create, discover, consume, invent, desire? You know, for me, this is one of the most incredible events that's about to happen. We're going to see this hockey stick accelerating in terms of innovation because these 4 billion people are all going to have access to the world's information on Google and Baidu. They're going to have access to 3D printing on the cloud. They're going to have access to AI. They're going to have access to a expert economy, access to crowdfunding. We're going to see the rate of startups and innovation explode. Tens of trillions of dollars that have never flown into the global economy are going to all of a sudden enter our digital economy. And it's the greatest time of innovation ever. But it's not just people we're connecting over these next five to seven years, right? We're connecting everything, everywhere, all the time. By 2020, my friends at Cisco talk about the IoT, the internet of everything, that we're gonna have 50 billion connected devices, a trillion sensors out there. So I have literally this is my ring, my aura ring. It measures on me my temperature, my skin, my heart waveform, acceleration. I wear this and it gives me sleep information. This watch over here has this sensor on the side that is measuring my EKG. And so we're just beginning, but eventually we're going to be going from 50 billion connected devices in 2030 to 500 billion connected devices. IBM announced something called smart dust, these micro sensors with computational power, solar powered, where you'll sprinkle the smart, smart dust everywhere, 100 trillion sensors measuring everything all the time, everywhere. So it's a realization that we're heading towards a world in the near future where we're gonna have hundreds of satellites imaging the earth, tens of millions of drones, imaging the earth at centimeter resolution, autonomous cars, hundreds of millions of autonomous cars with LIDAR and ultrasound and cameras, seeing everything in super high resolution and then augmented reality glasses with forward looking cameras. We're heading to a point in time where you and your AI are gonna be able to know anything you want, anytime you want, anywhere you want. It's a really important point I wanna make that in the future, you're gonna be able to ask a, a question, any question, and the data is gonna be there to answer it. I mean, you could ask a question if you're in the fashion design business, like what is the most popular color for bikinis on the beaches of Thailand today? And have imaging systems give you the exact spectrum frequency of the you know bathing suit colors and and you can say is there any advertising campaign that promoted that color and see if there's a correlation so we're heading towards this extraordinary time you're going to hear more about this a little bit tomorrow from uh, ramez uh, but let me just mention let's talk about the implications in transportation uh, this is google's autonomous car Basically, the you know Larry and Sergey uh, were fascinated by autonomous cars. They took the winning technology from the DARPA Grand Challenge back in 2006, and they basically commercialized it with Sebastian Thrun. And they built the first generations of autonomous cars, and they brought it to the car companies. And the car companies, of course, ignored it until they realized, oh my God, this is going to potentially put us out of business. 
And then every single car company starts saying, oh, we don't build cars, we make car as a service. So how fast will this kind of technology change our lives? Uh, there's a great analogy for it. This is the streets of New York in 1904. If you look here, we see all of these horse and buggies. If you look very carefully, you'll see in this image two automobiles. Back then in 1904, a very small number of bespoke manufacturers of car companies, of cars, 10% penetration. Fast forward to the year 1917 in New York again, it's all cars. The horse and buggy is effectively gone. And how fast did this happen? Well, the Ford Model T, the first mass production car, was created in 1908. And then by 1912 in New York, the car count, the traffic count showed more cars than horses. So I do expect that within 10 years from now, we're going to have a tipping point and car as a service is going to begin to decimate car ownership. And, you know, one of my friends, Jeff Holden, who was the head of autonomous cars and flying cars at Uber, his prediction, and I agree with him, is it's going to get to a point where you're going to have to have a special permit as a human driver to be driving a car. So we saw Waymo, which is Google spin out, uh, purchasing 20,000 of these electric Jaguar iPice vehicles. So as as uh, Ramez said, the exhaust from these electric cars is data. And so Google basically created data from the first million miles driven in the first five years of their autonomous car driving. There are 20,000 autonomous Jaguars will create a million miles worth of data in one hour. And these fleets of these cars are going to be driving towards networked effect as well. Here's GM's autonomous car purposely being uh, uh, released next year with no steering wheel, no pedal, no rear view mirrors. And so we're going to start to see autonomous cars change the game, right? No insurance. I have a home. It's got two parking garages. I'm going to turn both parking garages into spare bedrooms. I'm going to turn my driveway into a rose garden. I'm going to get rid of any place that I would normally park my car because my autonomous car fleet, you know, Uber, Lyft, Waymo, whoever it might be, my AI is going to see me getting out of, you know, getting up from my breakfast table, walking towards the front door. My AI knows my schedule. It watches me reach for the, for the handle of the front door. It's had two or three autonomous cars circling the block. And that AI pulls a car into in front of my house and I get out. It knows, my AI knows I didn't get a good night's sleep last night. So it basically calls an autonomous car that's got a bed in the back so I can sleep. But, you know, experts predict that within the next 10 years, car ownership will begin to die. And we have over 100 car brands out there. I honestly don't care what brand car picks me up in a Lyft or an Uber. I don't think I'm going to care what car brand picks me up in an autonomous car either. We're about to see a rapid Darwinian uh, you know, destruction of the car industry. But it's not just autonomous cars. It's flying cars as well. Larry Page has funded a couple of flying car companies. Uh, we see Airbus and Boeing uh, investing hundreds of millions of dollars. At my count, there's over a billion dollars that's invested in the electric autonomous flying taxi business already. Um, this is Bell Helicopter. Uh, they actually have just recently changed their name from Bell Helicopter to just Bell because they realize that helicopters are going to be going away. And these autonomous electric air taxis are going to be carrying people from location to location. So it's Boeing, it's Embraer, it's 20 different startups all doing this. And these vehicles are the requirements that Uber has set for their Uber Elevate is they have to go at least 150 miles per hour. And they have to at least to be able to go 60 miles. 
and carry four paying passengers. And their concept is actually aerial ride sharing. You're going to a mega skyport, you're hopping in with a few other passengers, and you're going from city center to city center. But it's not just autonomous cars and flying cars in the transportation industry. It's also things like Virgin Hyperloop. I'm a founding board member of Virgin Hyperloop. And these are vehicles that are traveling through evacuated uh, tube cylinders at 1,200 kilometers per hour, faster than a commercial jet, right? And here's the interior of what was proposed for the Dubai to Abu Dhabi uh, uh, Hyperloop. Instead of a two and a half hour drive, it's a 14 minute Hyperloop. Now, when we talk about disruption, and uh, this is a perfect example of what Ramez was referring to, the companies that are the most advanced thinking think about, okay, what could disrupt us? So, and they think about it way in advance. So here's a beautiful example of what could disrupt the disruptors. a and Airlines, all Nippon Air, uh, an amazing Japanese airline, came to us at the XPRIZE Foundation and said, you know, what could disrupt the airline industry besides other stuff that's going on? What if you didn't have to actually transport your body anyplace? What if instead I could, instead of transporting my meat body, I could transport my consciousness? So this is a $10 million ANA Avatar X Prize. So imagine in the future, instead of me, you know, transporting myself via Skype the way I'm right now, Imagine if there is a robot on stage right there in front of you with an e-ink face and I put on here in my living room in Santa Monica, Los Angeles, I put on my haptic, um, I put on my, my VR goggle, my haptic suit and as I look around, the robot looks around, I can come off stage afterwards and meet all of you, shake your hands and this is where we're heading where I'm going to be able to transport my senses and my actions into a robot on the other side of the planet. It'll be used for disaster relief, for health assistance, and things like that. All right, here's another implication of exponential technologies, and it's something that's near and dear to my heart. It's the notion that we're going to start to extend the healthy human lifespan. And I want you to imagine that our mission right now is to make 100 years old and use 60. So that 100 years old, you've got the aesthetics, the cognition, the mobility that you had at 60. I've had the pleasure to start two companies in this area and invest in a, a number of others, human longevity and cellularity. But there are companies in the stem cell business, in the senolytic medicines, in new organ regrowth, in companies like Moderna and United Neuroscience, and a whole slew of other companies. And as my friend Ray Kurzweil refers to it, uh, and it's a concept called longevity escape velocity that there's going to be, a, and this is Aubrey de Grey's work, uh, there's going to be a point in the not too distant future when for every year that you're alive, science is extending your life for more than one year. Uh, Aubrey and Ray call this longevity escape velocity, and, and Ray's prediction for when we're going to hit this is somewhere in the next 10 to 12 years. So I want you to think about what is, it, what is the effect on your business, on your industry, if people are living an extra 20 or 30 years? But of course, it doesn't stop there because those extra 20 or 30 years means that you in, that you begin to intercept other new technologies in biotechnology, in AI, in brain-computer interface that extends your life another 20 or 30 years, 100 years. How long will we live? This is a question that we're going to start to answer very soon. Um, as an example of how fast this is evolving, right? Uh, Craig Venter sequenced the first human genome in 2001 for $100 million dollars. Today, it's 1000 bucks. Illumina, the leading company in the field, has uh, equipment that within the next two years, it will be $100 and one hour, a million-fold price performance. But it's not just sequencing. It's also editing. Here's CRISPR 2.0 that you can now go and 
accurately edit a single nucleotide, 32,000 out of 50,000 diseases are due to one letter being wrong in the 3.2 billion letters in your genome. Imagine being able to correct that. In fact, some people are experimenting right now to edit their own genome while they're alive. All right, let's talk about another implication of exponentials, crowdsourcing solutions. So when I was growing up, I was enamored with space. The Apollo program was going on. I so wanted to be an astronaut. And at the same time, there was Star Trek. And Star Trek lit my heart on fire. And then I realized, you know, my chances of becoming a astronaut were one in a thousand. And a dear friend of mine gave me a book called The Spirit of St. Louis. And I learned that, that Charles Lindbergh crossed the Atlantic in 1927, not you know, on a whim, but he did it to win a $25,000 prize. And I said, I wonder if I can create my own prize to build private spaceships. And so I called it the X Prize. I'm, I'm now the founder, chairman, CEO of the X Prize Foundation. This was our first prize ever. It was a $10 million prize for the team who could build a private spaceship carrying three adults up 100 kilometers land, and then when two weeks make the trip again. Amazingly, we had 26 teams from seven countries around the world who spent $100 million. And so in this world today, we can crowdsource solutions. You don't need to know how to do it yourself. You need to be clear about what it is you want. This was the winning technology uh, that was manufactured, built, and demonstrated eight years later. Here it is in the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. We've built an incredible board of trustees and directors. We've launched $100 million, $150 million of prizes. Another $200 million are under development. We just awarded last week a prize um, that took place in India. It was a million dollars. Could you build a device that would allow any woman to uh, call for help in under 90 seconds uh, and have that device cost less than 40 bucks? The winning technology by Leaf Technologies came out of India. Uh, blew away the competition. We have 85 teams competing in this. We have going on right now in Tanzania something called the Global Learning X Prize. This is funded by Elon Musk. It's can you take an Android tablet and basically build a piece of software that can take a child any place on the planet from illiteracy to reading, writing, and numeracy in 18 months. We're in testing right now with 2,500 uh, children aged 6 to 16. We had 700 teams enter that. We're going to be crowning a winner in about 12 months from now. We have a Carbon X Prize going on. We've asked teams around the world, can you build a piece of technology that goes on a cold plant or a natural gas plant that takes the CO2 out and turns it into a profit center, manufactures a product more valuable than the cost of extracting it? We've got an X Prize going on right now, funded by Shell and the National Oceanic and uh, uh, Atmospheric Association, NOAA. And this is, can you build technology that can autonomously map 500 square kilometers at 2,000, 4,000 meters depth? We're down to nine finalists right now. I love this X Prize. It's going on in India right now. It's called the Water Abundance X Prize. And it's can you pull 2,000 liters of drinking water per day out of the atmosphere for under two cents per liter, right? Two-thirds of the world is humid enough where you can pull the water out of the atmosphere anywhere and give people clean, affordable drinking water. All right, I'm going to close with a set of slides on the concept of abundance and I had the pleasure of writing this book called Abundance, The Future is, is Better Than You Think. Um, I was the closing speaker at the Clinton Global Initiative many years back, and President Clinton you know, said, Peter, why are you so positive about the future? Don't you watch the news? 
And I said, President Clinton, I'm, I'm positive about the future because I don't watch the news and I look at the data. And the data is extraordinary. Over the last 100 years, the per capita income for every nation on the planet has more than tripled. The lifespan has more than doubled. The cost of food has dropped 20 to 30 fold. Energy has dropped 30 to 50 fold. Transportation has dropped hundreds of fold. Communications have dropped millions of fold in price. Uh, here's some of the data in more detail. So this is the year 1820 to today. In the 200 years, we have seen this massive reduction in extreme poverty around the world from over 90% to down near 10% today. This is literacy around the world going from 10% to literally 90% around the planet. Here is number of children dying under the age of five. 200 years ago, 50%, actually 45% of children did not make it to age five. Today it's 4%, still too much. But why is this getting better? Why are we seeing this massive reduction in mortality rate? This is women dying during childbirth. It used to be dangerous to have a baby. Now it's dropped down uh, in numbers tremendously. This is global average life expectancy. We've doubled how long we live, and we're about to double it again. This is interesting. A lot of people are worried about overpopulation of planet Earth. A lot of my friends in Silicon Valley are worried about underpopulation of planet Earth. So take a look. This is in the United States. This past year, total fertility rates dropped below the replacement fertility rate. In other words, the United States population is not reproducing at a rate that will allow it to grow. And, you know, one of the things that's interesting is birth rates for teenagers age 15 to 19 has dropped, you know, uh, for the first time ever. It's down 60% from 1990. But of course, look at this around the world. We're seeing the total fertility rate is steadily declining around the planet. So please, overpopulation is not the issue. Bill Gates gives a great TED talk. He says, if you do two things, you make a population healthier and better educated, its population growth rates plummet. So this is, the, in fact, another look at that. This is uh, children per family in the 1950s nearly 100 countries had, had uh, six or more children per family, and we see this dropping precipitously. This is automotive and airline fatality rates. Look at that orange line. Airlines are truly the safest means of transportation we have. In 2017, last year, there were zero commercial deaths. And that blue line is automotive transportation. So when we get to fully autonomous cars, again, that will go to zero as well. This is global death rates from natural catastrophes. You can see in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, why does that number go down? It's satellites on orbit. It's better sensors, better data. And this is from a friend's book, The Better Angels of Our Nature. And he shows us that over the last 60 years, we are now living during the most peaceful time ever in human history. We have a massive decrease in military expenditures around the world. And so why is this happening? Why now? It's not better politicians. I can tell you it is the impact of exponential growth. It's the impact of the technologies you're here to listen to today and why people come and get involved in Singularity University. So by the way, if you'd like a copy of these slides, if you just send an email to slides at diamandis.com, uh, if you just email, it doesn't matter what you put in the subject line, you'll get an autoresponder with a, a link that allows you to download these slides. So uh, with that, it's, uh, it's a pleasure and I'd love now to uh, answer questions if we have a few minutes for that. All right. <laughs> Thank
Thank you, Peter. We do, in fact, have quite a few questions for you. I have a couple queued up, so if you are ready, one that I think is particularly relevant given where we are and when we are right now, there's a question about how would you compare the exponential impact and innovation ecosystems in China versus that of the U.S.? And how do you see the landscape changing in the coming decades? What are the implications? Great question. So and you might want to mute on, on your side here so I can avoid the echo. I'll just take this out. Um, so I go to China every year at least once a year. Uh, and I run an event in China at the end of September in partnership with SU as well this year in Shanghai. It's, uh, I believe, the predictions that the innovation ecosystem in China today is accelerating at an extraordinary rate. Uh, Eric Schmidt um, basically made the prediction that China will pull ahead of the United States in artificial intelligence in these five-year time frame. And we're going to see, uh, you know, I'm seeing massive investments going on in uh, in AI. Uh, I think that uh, it's going to be a a race uh, of unparalleled proportion between uh, between China and the United States. Uh, I think that ultimately the dark horse that follows very quickly is India. Uh, India has got a very educated young population. Uh, and I think this decade, next decade is that for China and the decade that follows after that is going to be seeing the rise of India. Uh, and so that's just, you know, bluntly what I'm seeing in my, in my view of the world. Peter, I think a, a good follow on question that has been posed here when we're thinking about leadership in global technology. Um, one of the participants has asked what you see as the required skills, competencies, or characteristics of the future CEO to be able to effectively lead an exponential organization. Now, so that's a, that's a great question. Um, the companies that are the most successful are founder-led entrepreneurial companies uh, where it is – a founder who has an extraordinary passion for what it is they're doing, right? I, my second book was called Bold, and in the book I interview and write about Elon Musk and Larry Page and Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson, and the things that they have in common is that they're all massively driven. They have a massively transformative purpose. They're driven by their passion and their mission, and they're going to do whatever it takes to succeed. Uh, there are experimentalist and data-driven CEOs, meaning, as Ramez said, you know, Jeff Bezos has a very famous set of quotes. He goes, at Amazon, our success is a factor of how many experiments we do per day, per week, per month, per year. And if we're going to do ex a lot of experiments, we're going to fail, and we need to be prepared to fail. And so it's not about your opinion. As a CEO, it's about the data, and it's about building an organization that passionately is pursuing and driven towards doing the very best it can. Uh, you know, uh, Elon Musk, who I've had a chance, I've known very well for the last 20 years, is driven by his passion around space and his passion around energy. And he said, I didn't go into these businesses because I'm a masochist, right? I didn't go to compete against the industrial military complex or against, you know, the entire automotive uh, complex. I went because I thought that there needed to be a better product. And you saw him take extraordinary risks and literally reinvent both industries. He's completely reinvented the, the, uh, the space industry. There's no one even close. Bezos will come close because he's committed a billion dollars of his capital per year. Um, but the rest of the aerospace industry, you know, is far behind. And Tesla has reset the game for everybody. Yes, they're in a the fight for their life. But even beside that, they have shown us what's possible. So for a CEO, it's driven by passion. It's data driven and experimentalist all the way. And that's for me the most important. All right. Now, I think that's a, a good and useful answer there, but I wonder if we are perhaps falling into a tendency to, to focus on these charismatic 
visionary CEO leaders, to drive change from the top. And there are obviously merits to that, but I think so far on the program this morning, we've heard repeatedly about uh, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and a little bit about Bill Gates earlier, and we've talked about Steve Jobs. And right now, as Thailand is contemplating what they need to affect this vision of Thailand 4.0, there's a larger question about the readiness of the labor force. And I'd like to get your perspective. How do you think about uh, the challenges organizations face in terms of developing human capital and upskilling and continuous learning to be able to support the vision of the executive. Yeah, so again, a, uh, a great question. At the end of the day, the speed at which things are changing is extraordinary. And the challenge is that our entire educational program is built for a world that is 100 years ago where you would go to school till the age of 21, 22, uh, you'd work in the workforce for 20 years and then you would die because the average human male age was like 38 or 40 hundred years ago. But today you literally need to be in a constant, consistent period of education. And it's not about going to school and learning something and then utilizing it. It's about getting into a mindset of, absolute continuous education. So I am, I force myself to constantly be learning personally by writing books and by lecturing and by going to singular university all the time. And, you know, what we talk about, and I don't make a, you know, too much of a commercial, but the reason that Ray Kurzweil and I started XCU in the first place is to create an ecosystem where folks could come and not once in a lifetime, but every year, get brought up to speed on what's going on in computation, sensors, networks, AI, robotics, 3D printing, synthetic biology, because it's the convergence of all of these technologies together that are changing the game. And as an executive, it's not important for you to be the expert in those fields, but it is critically important for you to understand what the implications of those technologies are. And to be able to bring in the, the individuals to run the experiments. So, yeah, we talk about Bezos and Larry Page and Richard Branson, all those guys, um, because they're iconic. But what they're doing uh, is what the most successful young startups are doing. Again, one of the challenges are as soon as you become a large company, you become – basically uh, scared of taking big risks. And the reality is that taking risks is what is critical. Um, and if you don't take risks, if you don't experiment, let me give you the way I explain this. The day before something is truly a breakthrough, it's a crazy idea. And so if that's true, where in your organization are you trying crazy ideas? Because if you don't, you're stuck in an incremental mindset. And so ultimately, it could be that you take crazy ideas as the CEO of a company by investing in dozens of startups who are trying crazy ideas. And then as those startups fail or succeed, you basically invest in the ones that are succeeding but don't crush them by bringing them into your company, right? Um, that's probably the worst thing you can do. But study them, see what they're doing, invest in them. And as they grow, you can basically begin to build with them. Um, ultimately, we're heading more and more into a global ecosystem. And the challenge today for all CEOs, including myself, I'm involved in running a number of companies is constantly trying to find young individuals who are not risk averse, who are passionate about an area, and as Ramez said, give them the freedom to experiment and try crazy ideas, and then see which ones are actually, uh, you know, are willing to work. I mean, Jeff Bezos is smart, but it wasn't, you know, he wasn't the person who created Amazon Prime, it was Jeff Holden, who I mentioned before, who came up with this idea, and Jeff had the wherewithal to say, give it a try, try the experiment. 
and it worked. So it's up to you as a CEO or as an entrepreneur to be doing these experiments and giving your workforce the ability to try things more and more. Peter, I noticed that you mentioned this trend towards uh, a global ecosystem. And there's a question here that I think is a nice follow-on to that, uh, which actually uh, addresses the possibility of big tech now coming to stand in the way of further innovation and crowding the field. And the participant asks, if you see any merits to breaking up the big tech companies that have near monopolies and network effects that are, are prohibitive to any kind of new entrant in the field. So you're, you have both the pros and cons of that approach. On the, on the con side, it's the fact that you've got large companies like Apple and Google that are willing when they're, again, on a founder-led uh, experimentalist mindset, they're willing to invest massive amounts of money in trying big, bold, crazy ideas. Um, and it's because they've got economic engines of search or Amazons or whatever that allows them to take risks in other areas and try 100 products ideas and see which ones, uh, which ones fail. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting if you took Apple, for example, and you broke it up, I'm transmitting to you from a MacBook Pro, the revenues on just their MacBook alone would put that division as a Fortune 500 company around the world. So I don't, I don't know. I think, um, I'm, I, I think at the end of the day, uh, we need to be careful about antitrust where, I mean, the thing I don't want to see happening is a company buy a advanced product to kill it in order to preserve uh, their, uh, their other products and services. Peter, I understand that you are perhaps working on a, a new book. Is that correct? And if it is, could you tell us a little bit about, you, you said that writing these books is so important for your process of continuous learning, staying fresh, doing the research. Uh, what yeah. are you working on and when can we expect to see it? So the book's called uh, Convergence, The Future is Faster Than You Think. And it's, uh, you know, part of what I spoke about today. It's the fact that these technologies are converging uh, in extraordinary ways and reinventing industries. And so I'm clear that we're going to create more wealth in the next 10 years than we have in the entire past century. I'm also clear that we're going to reinvent every single industry this year. So in the book, I take a look at how uh, insurance and finance are going to be reinvented in this next 10 years and the transportation industry, entertainment industry, and the healthcare industry, uh, and you know the retail industry – all of these industries are going to be completely transformed by blockchain and AI and all of these things. And it's – I think it's – I'll give you just one small example that people don't think about. It's the notion that you know, today there's a massive advertising industry on television, on radio and all of these things. And it assumes that I as the viewer am making the buying decision. I'm buying that toothpaste over that toothpaste because I like that person's smile more than that person's smile in the TV commercial. But very quickly, none of us are going to be making those buying decisions. It's going to be our AIs where you just say, get some toothpaste. And the AI is able to know exactly the molecular makeup of the toothpaste, that this one is identical to this one, or that your social circle prefers this one. And it's going to be buying your toothpaste. The AI is going to be ordering your autonomous car and not care what brand car pulls up. Your AI is going to be buying a lot of the things for you. And it might actually know your genetics. So the food it's buying is actually better idealized for your genetics or your eating pattern than something you might buy because of a TV commercial. So we're going to transform the entire advertising industry. Um, so it's just one small example of how things are going to change uh, in, in a massive way. It's the convergence of all of these technologies and the, and the adjacencies of the markets and the business models that are going to basically 
transform us. And so one of, you know, going back to earlier question, agility uh, is critically important for, for CEOs. And by the way, if you're a board of a, of a C, if you're a members of a board of a company, your job as board members is to give your CEO a top cover that allows them to experiment and take risks because no CEO wants to take a risk and fail and then get fired. And so if you're instead covering your, you know, covering your butt, you're going to eventually drive your company down to the ground because you're not taking enough risks and innovating fast enough. And those are some themes we'll continue to explore this afternoon. For now, I will say, Peter, we are looking forward to the book. And thank you so much for joining us in conversation this morning. Thank you.